Welcome into the Atlanta Football Party. I'm Jarvis Davis. Coming up on today's show, Georgia is a little old school and it's working. This is Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it's time for the Atlanta Football Party, only on Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Atlanta Football Party, your home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk. It's local insight you can't get anywhere else, but right here at Locked On. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me are Jarvis Davis and Brent Rollins. These days, Every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. The Atlanta Football Party is also part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, as we await the next step, the next phase for Georgia on New Year's Day. There's still some tea to talk about as far as what's going on from last week. when We found out where Georgia landed at number six and out of the college football playoff to now. So we'll go between the hedges and talk a little bit more because a lot of, a lot of it relates to the transfer portal and winter signing day. But we'll also talk about what's up for ne- not just for UGA, but what's next up maybe for all of college sports because of a very unique and intriguing proposal from the NCAA president. But first, let's talk about you guys' top takeaways in the wake of the SEC championship. So Jarvis, you said no matter what, Georgia has an old school philosophy and it works for them. Yeah, because when you think about just kind of with all the the quarterback news and all the things going around, circulating around, you know, Georgia and, and, and how they recruit quarterbacks and everything. And just looking at the history of these guys, like the big time five star quarterbacks, they don't necessarily stick around, right? You know, and they and then Georgia kind of used the old school method, right? All right, come in, more than likely you're not gonna play as a freshman, and then you're gonna take a red shirt, you're gonna be able to, you know, get groom, be groomed and and, mm-hmm. and 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 basically, you know, wait your turn. And I think that that's not necessarily something that, you know, other schools ha- have done. And they've basically got to a point where they they have really have no choice but to kind of, hey, if you come in here as a freshman, more than likely you're going to play. You're going to have a good opportunity to be able to start. And I don't think that's necessarily the case with Georgia. Mm-hmm. But it's worked for them, though. Like they, To the tune of uh, a guy like Stetson Bennett, who they didn't want at first. <laughs> they sent him away. <laughs> and then he ended up coming back. And then, you know, and they were making sure that he stuck around. And then he eventually won a spot and won you back-to-back mm-hmm. national championship. So, so I think it's just really interesting that Georgia kind of has that approach. I don't, I know, I feel like sometimes they don't do it intentionally because, hey, they want to get the five-star guys in because, hey, You have to talk to those guys and you have to be in those conversations. But I really feel like they are kind of falling into the old school type of way of bringing in guys and and not necessarily having to have them come in and play right away. Yeah. And I think an old school approach that's not like a stifled or stiff approach, like say a Dabo Sweeney, I am like, you know, sort of the old man, get off my grass type of approach, but more of an old school philosophy of saying, hey, we are building and we're crafting you into someone who could be a championship caliber uh, player on Saturday, but potentially a championship type of player on Sunday. And yeah, I, I think it does work because it's almost like, you know what the machine does. So it's, you might as well just follow suit with the machine. And we know, and we'll talk about this, of course, in the second seg, but we know that it's not always the easiest thing because of the transfer portal and because of so many other opportunities that players even have to flip before they even get into college to do the transfer portal. There's so much flipping going on, but Brent, it's, it, um, so yeah, I, I think it's Brent, professional though. Yeah. Like, it is. like that's the thing you think about. It's, yeah, yeah. it's very professional football-y. Yeah. And when you think about, and I think not to get like too insanely nerdy here, but the way their offense is structured, when you brought in Todd Munkin, what you had was in 2020 when it was mm-hmm. his offense and you had COVID and you had no sort of, it, it was kind of, that was his offense. That was his most sort of hit his own offense. And it was very deep down the field. It, it didn't embrace a lot of the college elements, the quick game, the screen game where you just have better athletes and you can do these things. Mm-hmm. And then over the past two years with the people they brought in and all the different voices, it's blended his professional offense and the passing game of that 
with the college style stuff. So when you have that, you have one professional terminology. Mm-hmm. That's not e- like, it's not easy. It's not one word and go. And like, mm-hmm. and what you see and hear with, with just talking to a lot of people, especially within offensive football is like, it's not just a one word and go. It's not, you know, one read and go. It's not like it's, it's a different ball game in terms of what it is that they have. So that takes time. Mm-hmm. It takes time to learn, takes time to evolve. Like it, it's almost like what you see now with the Packers, even in the professional world where, you know, they play, get guys, they sit, they sit for a while. And then Jordan Love struggles a little bit. Well, then he starts playing a lot better because then you add the reps, the actual game reps to all that practice, all the mental work. So I think to me, it's one of those things where, it, what's going to be interesting about it is that model being built like it has been built. You have it, it's the plug and play might, might actually be difficult, like yeah. where you see you know people transfer in and they, they with Lincoln Riley system transfer in boom go Jalen Hurts does all kinds of crazy things Kyler all that wins Heisman's like mm-hmm. that's not this type of it's not this system that's not this system and yeah. staying and developing might be better for the long-term benefit of the quarterback, but it might not necessarily equal to plug and play or freshmen come in and play, things like that. It's just, it's just what they've evolved into. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, like, and that's okay. And I think that's, that's great. That's a great selling point, right? Because like, Hey, if you're a two or three star guy, or maybe even a four star guy, you're like, Hey man, like you might not be having the big schools come in, you know, and trying to guarantee you a starting spot in your first year, but Hey, come down, come down to Athens. And we're going to make sure you get all the professional coaching, the professional terminology. You're going to be able to familiarize yourself with all that stuff. So, hey, if we can get you to the point where we think you, we can, is which is to that next level, yeah. this is You're the place play. for you. It's yeah. an easy sale. It's an easy sale, especially in today's game with quarterbacks. And, like, oh, these guys are getting professional training in middle school, dang near. I know one of my friends who's a head coach yeah. in, in, here in, the, in the, on DeKalb County, He's a uh, he has his son in training and he's nine years old. I'm it's just like, what the world is it's, it's, it's normal. So it, I think that these kids getting that same professionalism when they go into college and going to a big time school that's been winning and they have a proven product. It's just, it's a great selling point in my eyes. I think it's 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 masterful in my eyes. Outside of that though, takeaway fan is still short for fanatic. And that's what in the in the wake of the SEC championship game, just the the way the Bama and Georgia fans going sort of back and forth at each other. The you know, the people like on UGA Sports.com on our message board, like, hey, I still haven't watched the game, rewatched the game yet. Like all all those kind of things, like it's still a crazy people love college football and and you know, sort of live and die by their team. And that that fan is really truly short for uh fanatic. And that kind of yeah. bleeds into uh recruiting a little bit, which is the topic of the day. And that's right. Just- <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, Brett, because I was listening to some shows just Saturday, right? And you're thinking, okay, it's been a week. Like nothing is going to change unless, of course, you know, Florida, the state of Florida successfully sues whomever they're going to sue when it changes. But other than that, it's totally- crazy, by the way. <laughs> that's not happening. <laughs> nothing in the legal process works that fast. Exactly. Well, you know, that's Florida doing Florida things. So, uh, yeah. But other than that, nothing else is going to change. But it was very interesting to me because when I juxtapose it, Brent, like the Falcons fans and their fallout over what just happened with the Bucks on Sunday, you know, they moved on, right? Like they have moved on. But the Georgia fans and that college football base, like you said, they're so fanatical. They're so frenetic with it. Like, no, it's been 10 days and we're like, no, we're not over it. No, I haven't watched that game again. And yes, I'm going to keep making my point about we should be in the college football playoffs. So yeah, it's absolutely frenetic. And like you said, recruiting is starting to heat up a whole heck of a lot. Now there's some conversation about who's going into the transfer portal, who stays, who goes, and who might flip. And that's what we're going to talk about next, because boy, did things get real interesting Monday night between the hedges. Again, we'll talk about it in a minute, but before we do, let's take you to and talk about LinkedIn. So one of these good days, I may become an actual business owner, right? And if I was, it would be a small business. That's where LinkedIn would come in for me because these days it's really hard to find the best fit for your company. Stakes are high. You want to be 100% certain that you get the best 
qualified candidate available because you don't want to have to go back to the market and start that process of hiring from scratch, training from scratch and all that. Well, that's where LinkedIn Jobs comes in because it helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. So you can go to LinkedIn Jobs and you can add your job and a purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. You can use simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus their leading competitors. So again, LinkedIn jobs, that's where you wanna go to find candidates you can talk to faster. You can post your job free. It's easy. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Again, that's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So, guys, the transfer portal and, of course, the impending Winter National Signing Day, which they were about a week and a day away, got a little jolt Monday when class of 2024 number one prospect Dylan Riola was rumored to be flipping from Georgia to Nebraska. So it kind of turned things on its ear. Now, that five star QB that we're talking about, of course, he committed to Georgia in May over Ohio State, Nebraska, USC, after verbally committing to Ohio State previously. But real talk, you can't overlook the fact that there are some deep ties in Lincoln for him. Dad was an All-America for Nebraska. Uncle is currently the offensive coordinator who just got a 53% raise and a promotion just last week to keep doing what he does for a few more years in Lincoln. And so it kind of makes you think like, and then kind of the kicker, a little bit of a cryptic message on social media from Dylan and, of course, confirmation that he's not going to open practice in Athens this weekend, but is taking an official visit to Lincoln. So, Brent, when you kind of heard this, what did it make you think about? I mean, what do you think is the driving force for this? I don't want to call it a shift, but a seeming shift. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you want to see your family for the holidays, right? I mean... <laughs> Who knows? Like his family's out there, but like obviously Nebraska is a, is a big deal to him and it's kind of home to him uh, because of his past and, and his dad and, and obviously his uncle there. But in terms of what it means, what it like, I honestly, I have zero clue. I, it, it's, I, I think what from a Georgia fan base standpoint, it's like, okay, well, you've been all about this. You moved to Georgia and played your senior year of high school football in Georgia, 45 minutes away. And, you know, now this happens right before things are starting to really, you know, in terms of actually lock into place. Mm -hmm. I, I, it just, it, it makes for a massively interesting uh, message board uh, week. That's for sure. But in terms of like what it ultimately means, like, has he said he's decommitted? No. Has he right. he says he's not going to Jordan? No. Like, but who knows? Like, because you're dealing with 17 and 18 year old kids, like it, that's you see flips on signing day. Like, you know, what was it? Uh, Travis Hunter on yeah. signing day yeah. says, No, I'm going to Jackson State. I'm not going to Florida State. Like, so like all anything can happen. Who knows? True. That's absolutely true. And the bottom line is sometimes. It, it might be some chestnut checkers. And again, we're all speculating because none of us really know where this came from. It came out of nowhere, but it could be as simple as, well, Nebraska's boosters or Nebraska's business people are talking more NIL money. That could be a part of it. And maybe, you know, it's time for some folks in and around the Athens program to ante up because kids can also do that. They can play both sides these days. The other piece is there were some rumblings of people familiar with him and familiar with some other situations that, hey, that competition in that QB room might be a little tighter than maybe he anticipated. So that might be uh, a cause for maybe him rethinking. You just never know. But I mean, Jarvis, when you heard it, like, what did it make you think about in your chucklings? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for me, like, you know, it makes me think like I have to do like a self check because you know a lot of times some of the things sometimes when you get into these conversations like oh my god these kids these days and blah 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 and I'm just like I literally did the same thing that Brent just mentioned like I was committed to Morehouse and on the day of uh, signing day one of my uh, my teammates pops he went to Albany State University 
He was like, hey, man, you want to ride down here? And me being a 17, 18 year old, I'm just like, sure, sure. let's go. <laughs> get out of school. Let's ride. So we go down to Albany. We take the trip down to Albany to get down there. I'm talking to the coach. I'd never met him before. Barely even heard of Albany State University before. And he was like, hey, man, just, you know, I know you committed to Morehouse, but, uh, you know, if you come down here, we, you know, <laughs> I say, if you decide to come down here, you know, we might be able to give your brother a scholarship too. I'm just like, but y'all, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you never see me play or my brother play. Like, right. How's this working? So I was just like, all right. So, you know, like, and it's, and it's so crazy because like, I, I literally called my mom today. I was like, hey mom, this is the situation. This is what's going down. And she said, son, I'm not going to tell you what decision to make. Like, it's up to you. And, it, you know, for as far as the situation down there in Albany, it ended up being better for me. It worked out being better for me because, like, hey, my brother was getting into school because he, he he was out of school that time. And he was looking for some place to go to school. And they were like, hey, we're going to pay for you to get you in. And we just going to start you as a freshman. We don't care what you did before at the other school you were at. So I was just like, all right, cool. Let's do it. So all that to say... I'm not surprised with Dylan Raiola because I made a decision based off my family. His uncle is there. His dad played there. And more than likely, he's probably going to have to sit for maybe a year if they get the McCora kid out of Ohio State. One year to sit and learn. And then I get to play with, with, with Unk right there on the sideline as the offensive line coach and my pops play here. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically coming to the conclusion that, hey, nobody should be surprised that this man. Now, if it was a school out of nowhere, USC or something like that, okay, now I'm thinking something is up, something stinks. But the fact that he's gonna get a chance to play with his play with his uncle and his dad played there too, like we shouldn't be surprised at all on this one. Maybe because you still don't know yet. Because like technically, yeah, still true, yeah, committed true. to, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. Georgia. Yeah. So it, like it's it's recruiting. Like nothing is real until it's signed and you're on campus and they're handing you a you know keys to whatever room or dorm or something like that. Right. And this and, too, Brent too. So my thing is. I always thought it was interesting, like college coaches are something else, because just back in November, what do we hear about Matt Rule? Well, you know, quarterbacks are going for $1.5 million or $2 million. You know, that's the going rate for transfer portal quarterbacks. I'm just like, and now all of a sudden, you know, like, right. Yeah. Hey, yeah. That's a big bill. By him. Like, cause you think about it, if he's, if that is you know, his words, his words, yeah. and if he gets yeah. the transfer plus yeah. gets the freshman, some, that's some. That's, that's pretty expensive, yeah. and yeah, you know, you know, the Nebraska been one trying to win for a while. Like Tony so level money. Be, yeah, man, that's <laughs> like the, the type of money numbers being thrown around, the math that's being thrown around in today's world in college football is just. It, I'm amazed, T. I'm amazed. <laughs> it's crazy, but it did kind of make you go back to thinking about the the QB room and thinking about you know, and not that we've heard any more on it, Brett, but thinking about where this puts Carson back and where this puts Gunner Stockton, like where does that QB room, what does it look like? And for going, this is going back to what Jarvis was talking about in the earlier segment with a school and a program that is perfectly okay with preparing you to take over as opposed to you walk through the door and take over. It's going to, it still just takes me back to very interesting QB room down there in Athens for this upcoming season. I mean, you would assume that Beck is coming back. You would make yeah. that assumption, but like, for Vandergriff, for example, like he had to get out ahead of that because you can't yeah. wait and then not have like it's the the calendar is ridiculous in terms of how all this works. But that's a whole other discussion that maybe we might have here in a little bit. actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think I think with Garner Stockton, like this, if he if he if he decides if Dylan Raiola decides to make that move, you gotta feel that at least got to get the feel that Carson Beck is gonna come back because ah like it, it just makes too much sense. Like, I mean, I've we've talked about had conversations on this show that we feel like he's played as a you know NFL prospect. He played himself into that conversation for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, how far do you do you think you can get? Like, can you get yourself into the first? Can you play yourself into the first round with another year at, at Georgia? in this offense, you know, so I, I, I just, I cross back has a very interesting uh, um, um, decision to make. I, I, I really feel like that because either you can strike while the iron's hot or you say, you know what, I'm going to come back for another year, have another opportunity with a plan, a super, super tough schedule in 2024. You know, that may be a factor as well. So it's just so many factors that goes into these decisions. And I feel like 
the uh, shout out to these college football players being in position to make the decision because Lord knows that we didn't have him 20 years ago. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And speaking of positions or being at the top of your game in your position, that's Brock Bowers and Malachi Starks. They made the first team All-American. This was the AP release. We know there are some other All-American teams coming out, but AP released this late Monday. Tate Ratledge and Cedric Van Pran Granger made the second team. And so Jarvis, when I looked at that list, I said, hmm, do we feel like the AP got it right on where these dogs landed? Did they miss any dogs who maybe should have been first team, second team, third team? No, I don't think so. I think they got it right this time. Um, maybe Kamari Lasseter, you probably throw could throw him throw him into consideration, but you got the corner from Alabama that was on that list, and he is absolutely he's we saw we got a, a really good peek into what type of player he is. So I are you gonna take him out? Like I can't, I'm not gonna say that. So I think that I think AP got it right. Bullard would be okay. the only one for me, like he as a safety. Uh, and if they had like a specific, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I didn't really look at. Did, if they have a specific slot slash nickel corner, maybe Tyke. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, yeah. then mm -hmm. no, I think, I think that's all. Those selections were pretty good. Yeah, yeah, and like you said, uh, no specific one for maybe that uh, slot. So, yeah, I think that uh, they got it right. And these are the names that we've been kind of seeing come to the forefront. And this goes back to you guys' point as well. When you have a first, a second, or a third team and you don't necessarily see Carson Beck's name on it, that could be a reason to say, hey, there's an opportunity for me to do some bigger and better things and maybe position myself a bit better for, for the NFL and maybe have that one more year under Mike Bobo to get him where he needs to be. Now, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about something that's not just potentially going to affect Georgia, but could affect college sports overall. But before we get there, let me tell you a little bit about FanDuel. So if you are someone who's been thinking, thinking, thinking about whether or not you want to get into the betting game, well, your time is now because it's super cold outside and you're probably going to be inside more often than not. So you might as well take advantage of getting to know more about FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Now, if you've been contemplating it, like I said, there's no better time to get in on the action. It's a really user-friendly app that has a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. So if you want to know more, if you want to get in on the action, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and got what, four, five more weeks of the regular season in the NFL. This might be the time to make that bet on an over under or player prop who might be the MVP because it's going up and down on who's going to end up with that award at the end of the year. Again, if you're interested, and I think you should be because $150 would be nice around this holiday time, fanduel.com slash locked on is what you check out. FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. So, guys, this story came out last week, but it also got kind of a refresher yesterday. And I thought, wow, this is going to be interesting to talk about on the Atlanta football party today. And that is a proposal that the new NCAA president, Charlie Baker, is making where basically he wants to set up a new college athletics model that would aim to benefit both women and Olympic sport athletes. He basically create a new subdivision of D1, which would allow schools to pay 50% of their athletes a minimum of about $30,000 a year. Of course, some would get considerably more, but that's kind of your, your, your base, if you will. And the proposal would make paying those women athletes and those Olympic sport athletes non-negotiable. So Jarvis, how do you feel about a proposal that seemingly looks to allow more athletes to take advantage of name, image, and likeness money and is maybe looking to be more of a regulatory entity over NIL, a la Title IX rules, as Charlie Baker put it. I, I think that it's a good start to the conversation. And to be honest with you, just from a, a pessimistic view, I really feel like this is a, 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 a pitch to make the NCAA relevant. Because yeah. like, like if the NCAA isn't going to help out to some degree or have some type of um, structure or overseeing this whole NIL deal. Mm -hmm. Like these big, these, um, these big time schools, they're, they're going to separate. I really feel like that that is, 
And it's make tape go. It's gonna take a while, I feel, because you know, obviously, you know, with conversations and money and all that stuff involved, this is gonna take a, a lot of negotiations. But mm-hmm. I really feel like, you know, this is Charlie Baker saying, hey, you know what? I'm I'm a little bit more involved than Mark Emmert. I want to be a little bit more out in front instead of, you know, uh, than, the, than the last guy that was in there. So I think right now, this is a a, a nice ploy to, because it, when, you, when you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because, you know, football and basketball, they're going to get the NIL, deal, NIL deals and they're going to get all the money, right? So I feel like something being in place for the non-revenue producer sports, I know that's kind of like a term that nobody wants to use, but it just kind of is what it is. Um, but to be able to have something in place for those people, like, you know, and are we going to, are you talking about maybe the 50% of the athletes or making sure all those are geared toward those Olympic sports or are the football guys or basketball guys going to be able to get more money than what they're getting on NIL? So those are the type of questions I would ask, but mm-hmm. I think overall, this is, this is good. I think it's a good start. And I, and I feel like at some point, you're gonna have to start having some real conversations about having something in play, making sure every everything's on the up and up when it comes to all these negotiations and deals and stuff. Because, like the idea of like I, I said it before, the idea of guys having agents in college and that's okay, <laughs> you know, like this is this is the it's the wild wild west. I absolutely love it because it's long overdue. It's been long overdue, and this is what you get. You get calamity when you don't, you ignore an issue. But I think, like, at this point, this is something that I really feel like I'm a, I want to keep an eye on because this yeah. is going to get very interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. It's – you said the Wild Wild West. That was the note that I had written down. And and, and basically, Pandora's box was already opened yes. the instant that Absolutely. happened. And to go Nick Cage and Con Air, it's hard to put the bunny back in the box. Like, <laughs> like – Yes. <laughs> Solid Nick Cage, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Like it's just everything retroactive now is insanely difficult. So much difficult with all this because now, and to me, bigger picture of all this, you have to, to me, include football coaches and college and men's and women's basketball coaches. Yeah. Like mm. let them help guide some of this because if you just include administrators to me, it, it's just, you know, and you got labor laws, the potential like unions, yes. like there's so many yeah, taxes, arms of all, all that stuff. Like man. there's so many <laughs> arms to this. So it's stuff. just, mm-hmm. it's a maze of, of mess. Right. But it, it, like Jarvis said, it's a start. And, you know, typically, obviously when you think about regulation and whatnot, when that gets involved, it usually ends up being not necessarily the greatest of things. Right. And, and you know you've kind of got a free truly free market situation and wild wild mm-hmm. west situation right now but it, it's it's a start it's going to be a conversation that's going to be had over the next and it's one of those things where it's, i don't think anything's getting solved or right. anything's getting put in place for years mm-hmm. but i do think no matter what they do all of it the calendar the portal everything that works with this involve mm-hmm. the coaches that deal with this on a daily basis yeah. Mm-hmm. And specifically, like I said, football, men's, women's basketball mm-hmm. and, and you know whatever other ones you want to, because it ha- there has to be, to me, some defined level of timing mm-hmm. for all yeah. of this. I think and, so, too. And the cap part, like NIL, is there a cap? Is there, right. is there a salary cap? Like, per right. how do you deal with it? How do you figure out the percentages that go to each person or each sport? Yeah. Who yeah. knows? I might and, need to like get three more PhDs to figure all that out. Right, yes. right, yeah, because it's gonna take all that. And my, I thought about this as well. Like, you know, you have in addition to the the great call on bringing in the coaches and some of their staff members who can give you some insight because they're a little closer to these players. They kind of know some of the ins and outs of how to make this work and and make it work effectively because you're dealing with different personalities. You're dealing with people coming from different backgrounds. And how they manage through the whole process will look different at student athlete to student athlete. But I also thought about the fact that they could get some advisory groups. Like I know there's one group out of Georgia, a guy who used to play for Georgia. And that's his sole focus is to help kids to understand how to manage through name, image, and likeness. So that's somebody who's played the game played it before NIL was legal and can maybe give a little bit of guidance. It's even different. And I was thinking too, there are programs in place 
when you enter uh, most of the professional leagues. I know definitely the NFL, the NBA, and MLB. And Jarvis knows I'm big on this because in my old life, I used to do some of their sessions. And those workshops are dedicated to, hey, where do you want your career to go? Because the average player has, you know, a lifespan <laughs> of four years, which is going right. to do uh, four years in a month. And right. so they'll teach them about finances. They'll teach them about mental health and put together a whole game plan to help those athletes who are interested or, you know, those professional players who are interested in finding out how to make sure that they can deal with all of this newfound fame, all of this newfound popularity and all of this newfound money. So I think that if the NCAA and they have tried it before, I just don't think that they've done a great job of enforcing it, but they probably need to put together some type of council like that. And it reminds me of what Grant Hill was talking about. And remember that council, he and Mike Krzyzewski were trying to put some things forward many years ago to say, hey, mm -hmm. these guys need to be paid, but we also need to put some parameters around how we do it. That's kind of what I envision as well, getting some of those guys who have been proponents of it for some time and who've also been close enough to it to know maybe a bit more than just the administrators who kind of sit in the ivory tower and don't know. I love what, you, I love what you're saying, T, but what you're talking about involves investment. Yes. Money, capital. Yeah, is the NCAA like Charlie Baker has a like you say he has a great idea, but what are you going to be willing to do? Not say come up with a plan. Hey, you guys can we're going to make a, a different subdivision, and y'all going to have to pay these folks all these money. But the NCAA going to have to invest some money as well. Yeah. Like you got to invest some money, get some employees. What they got? That barely they barely have enough employees to fill up my house, and my house ain't that doggone big. I ain't I ain't living it like that. So they go, if if they truly want this, they're mm -hmm. gonna have to invest some, they're gonna have to bring some people, they have to get some employees, some people yeah. who are gonna be responsible for different regions to go around to make sure everything is on up and up. I will say for anyone who really cares about this issue and the the sort of story and history of it, there's a great article from maybe seven, eight years ago, I think, in the Atlantic that basically laid out the history of the NCAA. Fascinating read. Absolutely fascinating read. And it was, it it makes you think way different about their existence. So I'll just say that. Right. We'll leave it right there. Right. <laughs> so I know what my homework assignment is going to be tonight. Anyway, thank you guys for stopping by the Atlanta Football Party, your home for the best Georgia Bulldogs football talk. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, come back for the Hawks postcast tomorrow night. We'll see you.